Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we are discussing Water for Global South communities with our special guests, Maria Cote Jose Tere Filiu, the Executive International Director of Water is Life, Dr. Mary Okumu, Senior Director of For Africa, and Eddie Brown, USA for Africa uh, leader. And we're so honored to have all of our guests. Tomorrow is Water Day. Yes. Water Day. And we wanted to take the opportunity to highlight your work to address water and sanitation for, for peoples in the global south. So could you give us an overview of Water is Life, which I love the title, right? It's it's just so true and it's it, it's so pregnant with meaning. Talk about your programs and, and the nature of your organization. Yeah, I would love to. Um, we all know that water is life, but we forget so because just after the air and the oxygen that we need to survive and to live, uh, immediately comes water. Then we think about uh, food or shelter or education or health that are all absolutely directed and, and directly influenced by the access not to just water, but to safe water. Everyone always is talking about the access to water, the lack of water, the scarcity, but nobody really puts an emphasis in safe water because after living for a few years, I've been living three years in Nairobi in Kenya now, and, and we've seen realities and there is water. We've seen rivers, we've seen lakes, there are so many boreholes, but the water coming from that water sources is not safe to drink. And what's the point of giving water to people if the water is contaminated and you cannot drink it, right? So uh, one of the things that we do in Water is Life and that we have been doing for the last 15 years is develop different projects where there is no access to save water. And how do we do that? We go there, we analyze the land, the location, we see where is that water source coming from, and we basically hear what are their needs. Sometimes we think that we know the answers, that we know solutions, but if we don't create these bonds, if we don't create relationships to understand, to hear, and to really comprehend what are their needs, there's no way that we can come up with a solution that would be sustainable in time. And even more important, if we don't involve the communities on being part of the solution. There's no way, uh, and, and there's no sense of going to Africa or any other place in the world where there's no access to safe water, drilling a borehole and just taking a picture, getting back in your plane, going back to your country. And what happened with that solution after six months, after a year, if we didn't get them involved and responsible of the management and the administration of that solution. So, so Mary, I see you nodding uh, uh, away there. So uh, you endorse that idea of, of it's really local communities. So you might have expertise from outside of a local community, whether it's in country or from a, from a different country, but you're nodding vigorously. Talk about, talk about your take on, on this idea that, that Cote is, is, is mentioning about uh, local involvement, local ownership, local control and power over the resource. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Maria and, and colleagues. For, for Africa, our entry point is that partnership with the community. The, the whole idea of we don't even say uh, capacity building because we find capacity building uh, again coming from top and telling them what to do. We actually invest a lot in understanding what the community needs are from their perspective, identifying the skills that they have. They were there struggling with those water issues and health issues and nutrition issues even before we were there. So we listen very carefully to what their conceptualization of what their needs and what their problems are. And then we co-create, we go together with the community and jointly agree, they prioritize what they want to do, including if they say we fetch water from that point, we, we, we go with them. We accompany the communities in our all our dealings 
But in water, we again rely on the water points that they know where the, the, the livestock gets water, where the human beings get water. And by human beings, it's mostly women and girls. Uh, uh, and and we, we then consult technical people to say, help us, here is what the community want. And the communities are center to our water and sanitation programs. And, and, and so, yes, I agree very much about co-creating, co-facilitating what the communities, indigenous knowledge about these things that affect them. That is how we can sustain uh, the investments that uh, we, we generate with them. We're going to get back to a lot of your points um, uh, because uh, we're going to deconstruct the, the issue of, of water and sanitation a bit. Uh, but uh, Eddie, uh, could you weigh in in terms of, of your role here in USA for, for Africa and, and how your role fits in this, in this uh, uh, constellation of activities that we're discussing? Yeah, thanks so much for that, Mark. I would say, Primarily, my role is around fundraising. And as Dr. Mary alluded to, the capacity there is in the countries. I lived in Ethiopia for the last six years. Arba Minch in southern Ethiopia has a university, world-class for water, uh, sanitation, hygiene, engineers, geologists. So often, it isn't even an issue of capacity on the ground. It's just a matter of resource mobilization to, to do the things that you need to do. A borehole uh, rig can cost millions of dollars. Uh, it, it's a highly expensive endeavor. It can cost $5,000 to $20,000 to drill a borehole. So you need that capital investment so that uh, these things can be done. Uh, Ethiopia gets more rainfall than Western Europe. So again, the water's there, the people's capacity is there, the expertise is there. It's just a matter of uh, mobilizing resources. Uh, not just from donor countries, but even within the country. So, for example, we raise a lot of money locally. Uh, we're doing a response right now to Cyclone Freddy in Mozambique. Local companies are donating uh, to our efforts to save lives. And ironically, often with, with emergency response where there's rainfall, where there's flooding, uh, water, uh, good water, uh, potable water becomes the issue. So, so yeah, it's it's a combination of raising funds on this side of the pond, as it were, U.S., Canada, our other affiliate offices of For Africa and Europe. Uh, but but again, it's it's mobilizing so that people on the ground can actually do the work. Now this is really important. So we're going to deconstruct this this model, this workflow, this cash flow, this human um, knowledge flow um, in, in this. If we're if we're talking about water and sanitation, we have a whole range of different issues. We have the issue of moving water to where it's needed, from where it is to where it's needed. That can be done by humans just putting uh, water in vessels and walking. It could be done through pipes, but pipes then can get tapped into, and then the then the water can sort of dissipate as people um, appropriate it because you know those pipes are are are, are unguarded, right? So there needs to be buy-in on how this whole system will work. There needs to be funding, as you said, Eddie. You need to have uh, money flowing to projects where there is needed, and there needs to be administration on the ground. There's the issue of water is not just water. You need to have, as as uh, Kote mentioned, you need to have water that that is consumer that is consumable that that does not come with uh, bacteria or or mineral uh, contaminants. Right? There are all these different issues. So, um, uh, Kote, could you talk a little bit about how you view the problem set and start to describe the various measures that you take to ensure that your projects are are um, are able to deliver the benefit that you intend to the people to whom you intended uh, uh, to you to whom you intended. Uh, yeah, it has to do absolutely what we've been talking. It's getting the communities involved. And usually it's not just doing what you think it's going to be it good. Start for with, with community involvement. Do you when you're thinking about a, a project, do you first go to the community and say, what do you need? How do you how do you how does a project start? 
How does the project start? We got one uh, last year in a, in a slum in Nairobi that's called Soweto, okay? So they had a borehole that was obsolete, that was not functioning since a few years ago because no one was in charge. So what we did is we unblock the borehole and we saw that it was still usable. It was it was working. It just needed to some some machinery and, and, and some added additional work. But then just after that, we realized that we had to put someone in charge. And usually what we do is identify the women that are community leaders because they are the ones that have to go and walk for miles and fetch the water every day. They are the ones responsible for bringing that water back home so they can wash, they can clean, they can cook, they can do all the daily um, uh, tasks that where you need water uh, to do themselves. So we identified Connie. She is our community leader there. And we said, we can't do this without you. And you have to help us to convince as well the whole rest of the community that this is a good for them. And as long as everyone participates and as long as everyone becomes commit to what we're doing, this is going to be able to be a solution in the long term. Because then you have to also speak to the elders. And we didn't know how to speak that dialect. We, I know how, a few, a bit of Swahili, but, but then we have to bring someone else that is part of Water is Life in Nairobi so she can translate and we can start telling the elders what are we going to do to benefit the community, giving them access to safe water. But it's a whole thing. It's a 360. Everyone has to be involved and aware of what this is going to, of how this is going to change the lifestyle. Otherwise, there's no way that you can do it. And it starts with, it's. you point out some really interesting uh, attributes, and I'd like to move to, uh, to Mary to have you comment, Mary, but you have a local request, right? We have a borehole, doesn't seem to be working. You then bring in expertise. Now, the expertise is interesting because you have technical expertise, you have linguistic expertise, right? You have community expertise. You're dealing with the social constructs of, of men and women and their various roles within those communities. You're dealing with the elders, again, another social construct, right, so that you have respect. Mary, could you talk a little bit about that idea of respecting different forms of expertise, different forms of knowledge? Because if you don't respect that, then you're likely to make mistakes. Could you talk a little bit about how that actually ought to function? in this world today. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Yes, the, the roles and responsibility, including children, depending on where the actual location of a water project, a toilet is going to be placed. Sometimes it is in the school, sometimes it is in the village, sometimes it is in a health facility, sometimes it is in the market as during COVID. We, we, we had to uh, put hand wash everywhere. So you, you, you understand the governance structure of that community from the elders, as Maria has, has said, you seek their guidance, what has happened in water and sanitation before in this community. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and what were the results? What were the challenges? And, and you want to learn before you, you decide what, which, where, that understanding of what you're dealing with. If it is in a school, you engage the school management board. The government, for Africa, we respond to government uh, uh, development plans. And these government development plans go to the last mile. And, and so if it is within a district, you, you sit with the district teams, the district teams will be the ones now holding your hands through that mechanism up to the last mile in the village. So everybody has a role in helping to understand, was there any water project or a school feeding program? What happened? If it is because of a disaster, that's a completely different scenario uh, entering a, an a humanitarian emergency with the, the investments in, in, in water and sanitation. Those ones are normally 
guided by the UN and, and, and the local government authority. If it is within the context of sustainable, normal peacetime development, what Maria has defined absolutely holds until you form committees uh, in one project, water and sanitation, uh, going back, Mark, to the role of men, the role of women, the role of girls, the role of teachers. So there are layers and layers of governance that must come together and agree with you. And, and, and then uh, you then identify what community uh, skills, uh, where are the artisans, uh, who, where is the water going to be tested and, and working very closely with government entities that also already have a, a plan on how you enter and how you exit. And it strikes me, Mary, that um, it starts with first being humble, right? I'm a fairly intelligent person, but if I came into that environment, I would be the most ignorant, 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 useless person in the room. That's true. That's just true. It's just a fact. I just don't have any knowledge, right? So, And, and we don't have the knowledge of the local uh, communities. We really don't. And, and therefore, the, that respect, we talk about the dignity of people, but just making that inquiry about what has happened here, who are the leaders, just giving them that hearing, that platform for them to be heard, for them to make the decisions with you, they will inform you. You know, you can go to a, a community and they'll watch you. If you think you know, <laughs> they will watch you fail and then they will just walk away <laughs> and you will be calling meetings under trees. Nobody will be coming because you thought you knew. Right, exactly, exactly. And and so when when Eddie, when you're raising money for this kind of a situation, your donors need to be informed. They need to come from a particular place of respect because although if if money comes without respect, it will still be taken, it actually has a different impact, right? If 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 donors are are willing to open themselves up as people who in this situation live in ignorance and wish with their donation to listen and learn and make a contribution, but also be willing to accept the contribution of others, it makes a real difference, doesn't it? Absolutely. And my favorite field trip is to take donors to see us hit water. when Because you, you drill and it can take time and the geologists, the the engineers, they, they can have a sense, okay, they're monitoring everything. And so they can tell you, okay, we're going to hit water tomorrow or maybe the day after that. And when you go with donors to see that, it's something so tangible. So kids are celebrating, water's flowing, and it, it connects us as human beings. We all need water every day. We can live days without food. Uh, we can't live very long without water. So uh, it's that human connection that I think is powerful. And just to allude to something Dr. Mary said earlier, she mentioned COVID, you know, water, water is life. We've all said that, but water is also connected to everything else in life. Food. Uh, if you don't have water to irrigate your crops, uh, you won't be able to, to harvest food. Health. Obviously, there's a lot of waterborne diseases. And what we learned during COVID, uh, we've been trying to convince people, wash your hands, you know, do these basic hygiene principles. And COVID made it real, very tangible. And so we hope that sticks. That's one of the silver linings of COVID is around uh, increased attention to sanitation and hygiene, not just the access to water. Maybe another piece that's also very powerful is uh, the impact of water, particularly on girls, because girls often have that responsibility of carrying it on their head. Uh, it can take hours if it's far distance away and that can keep them out of school if there's not hygiene and sanitation materials at the school, separate latrines for girls and boys that can prevent girls from going to school. And the walking, the distance, one of the greatest risks for girls is uh, often long distances, late at night, early morning, they can be uh, subject to, um, to horrible things. Uh, so there's child protection issues related to water as well. So the closer we can bring water to communities, to households, the, the better off uh, girls are and, and the community in general. 
Can we talk about Let me this? add something to that, Eddie, if I can add something. Sorry, Mark. Um, oh, sure, Corte. Yeah, as, as you were saying, it impacts everything. It, as you said, health and education, also environment. We've realized that when we bring a filtration system, they don't have to boil the water anymore, or they don't have to buy it and take it from the budget that it's very little in order to buy bottled water. And that's when it's directly impact to the environment because there's no combustion, there's no pollution anymore. And that it's absolutely directed to our consciousness. I'm here in New York right now. And I was a few days, ago, a few uh, weeks ago in Chile where you can drink water from the tab. And I was asking my friends, why, why are we in a restaurant and why are we asking for bottled water? Why are we contaminating with plastic? Why are we spending extra money if we can really drink water from the tab? Can, can anyone explain that to me? Yeah, well, these, th these issues are interconnected because those plastics find their way into the food chain and then we eat them and then we're poisoning ourselves with them and then we, we have health problems. I'd like to stay with you, though, Cote, and talk a little bit about the fact that we have we have uh, two men on this on this uh, show, and we have two women, and we've been talking a lot about the role of women within different cultural contexts within different communities. Could you just comment, and then I'd like to go to uh, to Mary in terms of of this whole idea of how do you respect the cultural attributes of people on the ground? Um, and take advantage of their knowledge of, of what works within their communities and the various challenges that men and women face. It seems to me that we have a grand debate going on in different societies about empowering women and how men and women interact. How does this unfold in your observation, Cote? Uh, uh, and, and then, Mary, if you could also comment in terms of of are these projects creating a different platform in which this dialogue between men and women and empowerment within those societies uh, functions? Cote, uh, would you care to comment on that? Uh, I can just tell you about what I've seen, and that's based on my experience living in, in Kenya for the last three years. And I lived for six months in Angola, in Tanzania. I've been in Ghana, uh, in Uganda. And, and I've seen that women are the ones that are the responsibles of bringing water. And without water, you can just do nothing at all. And they are the ones that are taking care of the children, taking care of the house. They are the ones that are working on the land. I've seen women very, very much empowered in, in the way that they are um, the ones doing pretty much all the work. Are the men, are, are are us men listening to the women in these different cultural cultures so that we're, no. we're no, not, no, no. we're not. So, so the men are not, Mary, uh, you're, you're smiling. Are, are, are men not listening to women? It, it, it takes that process of consultation again and respecting those social roles with the intention of creating the dignity of even the men. When, when men see that now water is near the home or there is water in that school X and the, their women don't have to walk, honestly, three to four hours a day and girls can go to school, there are societies that it is slow, the listening to the women, but empowered women make incredibly uh, resourceful uh, uh, communities and households. And the men, sometimes they feel threatened by that empowerment, but when you facilitate that equilibrium, you do find it. Um, there, where there have been conflict, uh, uh, Mark, in, in a refugee camp, is the women and children who will arrive there first. Mm -hmm. Who will, who where will it, Yes, and, and so there are, in where we are working, there 
are being listened to because they do they do add value by what they do. But socially, the social constructs of water is it's a woman's responsibility. But when it comes to the dr drilling, the men do play a role in drilling. So the, the, there are, you can't compartmentalize it by saying, no, they don't. Sometimes there are friction areas, but we, that's part of why we are there to help them to, to focus on the access of safe drinking water. When water is near home for animals, it's the men who go and tend uh, to cows and, and, and sheep outside. So when the water is near, they also celebrate in South Sudan, in Northern Uganda, in, in Rwanda, in Mozambique. Uh, when calamities strike, everybody's affected and you support the ones we have water committees that have both men and women in the management that Maria was talking about once the borehole is rehabilitated. We do have uh, water management committees that comprise of men and women. So in, part of this, the, Mary, is that is that we need to have respect from the uh, G7 and G20 sources of funding, the wealthier nations that are sources of funding for those uh, peoples that are absorbing the funding. There needs to be mutuality there, but also on the ground between men and women, there also needs to be mutuality. If we, if we end up with mutuality, we end up with a more peaceful resolution. We have a quicker resolution. Everybody feels involved. Everybody feels ownership. This idea of mutuality is so, is so powerful. And it starts with listening and respect on all sides, whether it's within a community, between men and women. That's your point, right? Yes, thank you. And well, I'm, I'm just listening to you and repeating your point. And it is happening. It is. No, no, you heard me. You heard us correctly. And it is happening. And, and, and whether it is in the school board or the parent teacher association board that is going to manage the water uh, or whether it is in schools where boys and girls go to school together, you do bring that mutuality. And, and there is mutuality uh, uh, when everybody, when the resources are available enough, then people don't have to have conflict. Uh, it's not only men and women. Women can fight over being on the line uh, they've walked seven hours, they're now on this line. If another colleague comes and just goes in front of her to put her jerry can in front, there will be a scuffle. And so that mutuality, uh, we, we, we are uh, facilitating those dialogues extremely well, and we are finding um, uh, respect that we talk about the dignity of, of men and women and boys and girls. It is coming. I mean, we, for Africa has been there for 37 years. In the communities that we work, uh, we are advancing and facilitating that mutual agency of voice, agency of consulting for them to contribute their ideas on what they feel are their solutions. Thank you, Mary. Eddie, we're gonna give you a word and then we're gonna give Kote you the last word. Um, Eddie, I, I just wanna ask you about this idea of mutuality as you as a, in your fundraising role. Um, how do you deal with this, this idea of, of creating a relationship that is more sustained and less transactional, less power-based, um, and, and more equality-based. Um, when you're asking somebody to give of their money, they're not going to get any. They're not going to get anything material back, right? They're not going to get any material, anything material back. You, they're going to get something else back. How do you? How do? What do you? What is the thing that they get back, and how do you end up with a situation where you have mutuality, respect? and sustained investment as opposed to a transactional one? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, so, you know, for Africa, we started um, very much as a as a church based organization. Our founder was an evangelist in South Africa, and he uh, was very struck by what he saw during the war in Mozambique. So for us, our, our history, our foundation is around church to church partnerships. So I think that that builds relationships at a, at a community level. Obviously, a lot of uh, NGOs have um child sponsorship. I think that's another powerful way where you connect people. So it's not just about giving. It's not just about charity. It's about connecting. It's about people feeling uh, a sense of a shared uh, human experience. Like I said, with that example of uh, seeing the water uh, hit uh, in a borehole, we all, we all have basic human needs. We need water. We need protection. We need food. And so I think it, it's getting away from that charity mentality and getting towards this human connection mentality. Uh, you see it more now, I think, with the internet being ubiquitous and people having more access, uh, that intermediary role that uh, uh, humanitarian organizations, development organizations have played is, is transforming so that there's less of a gap, uh, a communication gap. Uh, people can speak in real time. People can see what's happening. We we post on our website videos of, of the impact of people's giving so that they don't have to wait for a report six months later, three months later, they can see in real time the impact. And, and that that motivates them to give because they can see the impact that it's having and and they can see the connection that we're all in this together. So, um, Kote, I'd like to I'd like to give you the last word. And, and the thing that I uh, that, that I'd love for you to comment on is how we should all function in this world to help resolve this global problem of water. But I want to just read back a couple of the results of the polls. First of all, 100% of the people who responded, and we have a select audience here, think that this issue of accessibility to water is one of globally the top uh, issues that we all face. So the fact that um, there might be an issue in the global south or an issue in different parts of uh, the United States, that's actually given... Um, uh, one particular footing. In other words, access to water is essential for everyone. That was 100%. Then we talked about what is the what is the major issue? And the major issue seems to be a consensus that water is available, but not necessarily accessible. And so if we bring resources to bear, we can solve the problem. And the third, uh, the third uh, poll, which is still ongoing, it's really interesting, the results there, um, about a quarter of the people responding said that there, that fixing this issue of water is a glo is is a problem that can only be solved by global South uh, governments within their country. Sixty three percent, two thirds of uh, of those responding said it's a collaboration among global South governments, G twenty governments, international NGOs, local people on the ground. Basically, the model that 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 you have. Very interesting, but those were the only answers that were given. There was there was uh, there were some respondents who said that that the answers were not included. So this is it, it's just sort of a, a really interesting encapsulation. Um, Kote, what what is the act that we should take next? We should all take next to improve the situation. How should we move in the world? How should I move in the world to help you in your mission? Uh, first of all, I, I totally agree with Eddie, what Eddie was saying. Um, this is transforming. And when you ask what do we give companies or different supporters that make us or that give us the funds so we can develop different projects, it's a transforming experience. Uh, we were doing one of the one of our projects in Chile uh, at the last at the end of last year, and we took the clients of one of our biggest partners uh, to to give out the filtration systems to people that live in unsettled uh, and in an informal settlements, and they were the ones in charge to change the people's lives through these bucket filters that we gave them. And what they lived, their experience was so incredible that there's a before and after. After you feel that, after you've done uh, something with your own hands, after you've become involved personally with, with other people that haven't been this lucky, you will never want to stop doing this again. So, so that's what we give. It's, it's a life experience. It's becoming a better human being. And when you realize that, you have to know that in 
the same way that we were talking about how we go to a slum, how we go to a village, and we have to get all the actors involved, the women, the men, the teachers, the children, we have to do the same thing outside there. Public sectors, uh, um, companies, the governments, we, people, we have to get all involved together so we can make this happen and we can give them a solution that will change their lives forever. A fantastic admonition uh, to take us out. Uh, Maria Cote, Jose Teref, will you, Executive International Director of Water is Life, Dr. Mary Okumu, Senior Director of For Africa, and Eddie Brown, USA For Africa President. Thank you so much for sharing your work, sharing your knowledge, sharing your expertise. And please thank, please thank your donors, your staff, your boards, and your communities who are helping to guide you in your work. Thank you so much and, and really very much appreciated. Thank you, Mark.